Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. This week we look at the upcoming US election whilst the country grapples with the coronavirus, civil unrest and a toppling stock market. Republican Trump is pushing on, pro promising more stimulus, election eve vaccines and firing off shots at the US postal system in an attempt to stymie postal voting. Past Vice President Sleepy Joe Biden is on the Democratic ticket promising to right the wrongs on health care, expand green investment and lift the minimum wage whilst raising taxes on the wealthy. With the polls favouring Biden throughout this pandemic-ridden 2020 election cycle, the question remains, can Trump reenact his 2016 performance and pull off another surprise victory at the ballot box and thus avoid being the first president to not serve a second term since George Bush Sr.? Or will Biden be able to maintain his lead and restore some order to the United States political system and perhaps the markets? Here to run through our thoughts and discuss how they may be incorporated in our portfolios, I'm joined by Nucleus Wealth's Head of Investments, Damien Klassen. Hello to you, Damien. Hi, Jim. And also on the line, we have our Chief Strategist, David Llewellyn-Smith. Hello, David. G'day, Tim. Fantastic. Good to have you on, fellas. And just a quick reminder before we get started to subscribe on YouTube and click on the notification bell to be notified of when we go live or have a new webinar to watch or follow us on your preferred podcast platform. And for those listening in live now, feel free to drop in your questions in the chat box at nucleuswealth.com forward slash webinar and we can answer those along the way. So the agenda today, we're going to kick off by looking at the polls. Uh, we'll then run through the platforms for the, the two major parties. Uh, we'll be looking at some black swans and outcomes, uh, peeling across to the markets and then finishing up as we do on uh, the investment outlook and how we incorporate these themes every day here at Nucleus Wealth and in the MB Fund. So on that note, we'll jump into the polls. David, Biden ahead. Uh, yeah, well, he's been ahead consistently uh, for... Well, at least the duration of our chart. I think it's a couple of years, uh, and uh, gotten a very big boost during uh, the 2020. Uh, sorry, well, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, etc. And uh, that polling gap uh, has been very consistent for some time. You know, kind of six or eight points. Uh, you can take or leave the polls, of course. Um, we saw. Uh, smaller but similarly consistent leads in the 2016 election for Hillary Clinton, which of course uh, didn't didn't play out at all as expected in the election proper. Um, but you would hope, and I don't have evidence for this, but you would hope that the pollsters have adjusted their methodologies uh, appropriately since, and so that these polls would be somewhat more reliable. Uh, but there is a risk that um, that they'll, we'll see a rerun. But the polls, for what it's worth, are still firmly in the Biden camp. Uh, that's also the case in the battleground states, the swing states that are going to matter, where the gap is smaller but is still pretty consistent, around four points. Uh, obviously, these polls swing around, uh, you know, um, with their margins of error and the different practitioners and methodologies and what have you, and so you'll see different different readings on that gap. But these these charts I've got up here, these are aggregated charts from from Real Clear, and so they should capture all of those uh, variables reasonably consistently. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Biden's on track for a reasonable win, uh, and that is also reflected in. A, a decent gap in betting markets, which have had a much wilder, wilder ride than the polls themselves, uh, with huge kind of um, uh, lead for Biden until recently, uh, when you know the COVID-19 numbers started to fall away, uh, and perhaps also Trump, uh, you know, uh, gained a little bit of his mojo back with his attacks on China and attacks on. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, and that kind of segueing into, you know, a law and order issue or recouched as a law and order issue as various protests have have have, have merged or, or uh, I'm not, 
don't want to be uh, overly sensitive to this, but um, um, either protests or riots, depending on which side of the, the aisle you sit. <laughs> um, anyway, that, that has segued into a law and order issue that may give Trump some extra uh, traction. So, but and, and I just want to highlight as well, Dave, look, I mean, because one of the things I find interesting is this, is that the point you're saying about, um, you know, there's a lot of people who go, well, yeah, the pollsters, they've got it wrong once before, and so therefore they'll never ever get it right ever again. Um, <laughs> And, and yes. so whatever they say, it'll be the opposite um, is sort of that part about going, well, yeah, look, you know, they, they obviously did make some mistakes, um, but uh, you know, the, the, to, to give them some credit as well, you know, most of the two-way votes, um, they actually got Hillary's votes pretty, pretty close to right in terms of the, the, um, the way the voting was going. And um, they were behind probably two or three percent in terms of, in terms of Donald's votes. Um, but, and, and keep in mind that, you know, Hillary did win by two percent in in terms of the popular vote. Like it wasn't a it wasn't a small, um, wasn't like a small gap. So so you know if you if you looked at this one, and you said okay, well, um, you know you could you could on this chart you could have um, what do we got? We've got Biden at fifty percent. Um, you know he could. Um, I guess what I'm thinking is if he could win the popular vote by two percent and still lose the election, two or even three percent mm. and still lose the election. And so, you know, you don't actually need, um, like, it needs to go back to the, to the individual states and the individual sections about which which states are likely to fall or, or rise, and, and 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 sort of taking it to, you know, back to that part about saying the polls said Hillary would win and and she didn't, therefore the polls are wrong. Um, yeah, sort of I think ignores some of those those bigger issues about um, the distribution of where it's coming from. Mm. Uh, and I'll just add from what qualitative stuff I've read. Uh, on on where the movements are demographically, it seems uh, elderly white centrists have shifted away from Trump, uh, which you could put down to any number of reasons, but certainly the virus presents itself as a uh, a prime candidate, uh, and and um, Biden has lost a little bit of minority support mm. apparently. Uh, which may surprise some, but uh, there you have it. Uh, I think, for instance, his uh, strong China stance has actually played very well in like the Asian American community, things like that. Hmm. Um, okay, so moving to uh, moving on then. So you know we've got we've got the Dems as favourites, basically, um, pretty firm favourites based on the polling. Um, so segue that into into the uh, the two platforms. Uh, and Biden um, basically, you know, could be couched as it's not quite an empty chair platform. He's got some some pretty decent economic uh, reforms, um, but certainly smallish target, I guess you would call it. And to that extent, he's trying to make it a sort of referendum on Trump. <laughs> um, uh, and his platform is very much about, you know, uh, reconciliation and unification. Um, bringing the country back together, which you know clearly is is a dig at um, Trump's divisive politics, but but as well, uh, it it you know neatly addresses some of the civil strife that we've seen in the last year or so, um, as an angry population has expressed itself through you know various racial protests and divisions. Uh, you know what we'll see with with uh, Biden is you know more virus science. Um, which you would think it would would appeal um, to a fairly broad cross section of people, especially centrists. Uh, it, you know, he has probably his most innovative area is tax reforms, which are to wind back some of Trump's corporate tax cut and to boost uh, taxes on the wealthy. Uh, you know, especially around. Um, uh, things like capital gains, etc., uh, and yoke that with minimum wage increases. So th these are some good, uh, we think very good long-term reforms to help uh, address US inequality and therefore good for growth insofar as they'll boost domestic demand. And, uh, uh, you know, that that's useful uh, to, in all sorts of number of ways, um, everything from rising wages to increased investment uh, to offset rising wages and therefore driving higher productivity and higher incomes, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, and so that would actually be a bullish outcome for the US, though, you know, initially it might shock the stock market because it's a bit of a regime change, especially with the higher corporate taxes. Um, much more constructive on, on the green economy, obviously, both at home and abroad. Uh, that would pose a bit of a problem here, I suspect, but in the US, uh, you know, uh, how that will play in the election, I really can't say. Um, certainly, it'll it'll uh, be play well to the, the Democrats' base. Healthcare, similar. Uh, Biden's committed to the Obama reforms. Uh, and again, good for the, the Democratic base, good for, I would have thought, centrist politics. Uh, and, you know, much more constructive internationally, um, Certainly, uh, very uh, still quite firm with China, uh, but uh, less tariffs and m much more of a multilateral approach. So again, you would think for centrist, pro-American uh, policy um, followers, it's probably strong enough on China. Uh, and then BLM, um, Black Lives Matter. I mean. He hasn't really put out that too much policy I've seen on what he would actually do, but certainly his rhetoric is much more uh, conciliatory than is Trump's. Uh, and at the end of the day, you would think that law and order uh, is basically a bipartisan issue and uh, it would come down to negotiating what, what the outcomes are going to, for, for BLM, uh, will need to be. Um, and, and actually, Biden does it. Does actually um, he polls better on who's going to um, who would be better at, at managing law, the law and order side of it. Mm. So, in terms right. of the thing, yeah, yep. when when people actually get asked the question is who who do you trust in charge of it? Um, yeah, he does poll better. So, <laughs> so I mean, it is much more of a centrist platform uh, than if we flip over to Trump, where uh, it's much more about base politics. Uh, uh, divisiveness and and really trying to peel away uh, some traditional components of the democratic base that uh, you know are, are generally associated with working classes. Um, so it's it's obviously smashed China. Uh, and would it be actually be any worse or any more so than what we've already seen uh, in the last cycle? hard to know but certainly the rhetoric will suggest it is and he's definitely doing a, a very good job of bashing up various chinese asset, assets in the us to make that point uh i i would just think his virus outlook is almost pure voodoo any number of uh examples of that and i need to go into it um uh, and i just can't see how the virus can play well for trump at all um like as Winston Churchill once said, the U.S. always does the right thing when it's exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> and the right thing is clearly to treat the virus with science. I mean, you can debate what that means, but it's certainly not disinfectant in, into the veins. And uh, so, you know, I, with 200,000 deaths, which is, you know, half as many Americans have died in the Second World War, it's... Uh, I just seems catastrophic for me to me for the virus uh, the virus vis-a-vis -vis trump um, so uh, particularly with centrists and, uh, and elderly centrists you know who are obviously on the receiving end of the worst implications of that uh he's also quite committed to infrastructure which will appeal but uh questionable whether he can actually deliver it um the democrats have plans to fund infrastructure by its various taxes was Trump does not, um, but he's he you know there's some some chance of that. He's also mooted some small tax cuts uh, around the margins again for businesses. Uh, obviously, much harder on borders, much harder on American first diplomacy, and much harder on BLM and law and order. Um, so I mean they're just much less centrist. Uh, uh, it's a much less centrist platform. Uh, and is unlikely to appeal, obviously, to to the centrists who are, you know, somewhat shocked and awed by, um, firstly, the Trump regime and secondly, the virus. Uh, so, I, I mean, I would just put those two platforms down as uh, as probably the Dems being um, more opposite to the times. Um, and, and I guess in terms of investment 
um, perspectives though on, on those two platforms. I mean, the biggest one uh, comes out is the the Biden um, tax raising taxes. Yep. So that's a yeah, um, yeah, and 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 the minimum wage increases. It's it's that interesting part about you know you, you need to save at times capitalism needs to be saved from itself, but um, yeah, the, the immediate impact of minimum wage increases is that companies are going to make. A, a smaller share of the, they're going to take a smaller share of the national pie than what they than what they have been in the, in, in the recent times, and um, while we think that's uh, that's actually a good thing for your five or your ten year outlook, um, it's pretty hard to, to to come up with a a scenario where that's good in the in in the one or two year look, outlook on on earnings. Yeah, well, I guess uh, you know in terms of uh, the election as well, it's it's. It's redistribution versus trickle down economics. Mm. Uh, you know, is the US ready for some more redistribution politics? Um, I mean, the rise of Bernie suggests it might be. And certainly, you know, uh, plenty of anger over inequality. I guess the question yeah. is, does, does Trump's angry um, you know, diversion of that anger capture those, those disaffected workers, or can a more rational approach win them win them back to the Dems? Yeah, and I guess I'm just trying to I'm trying to step outside and say, look, let's I'm, I'm not even but let's not we'll speculate that at different times. But I just want to I guess nail down those those investment sides in terms of saying, okay, regardless of whether of which which argument wins the emotional argument, um, in terms of the investment argument. Um, in, in the short term, um, it, it looks as if uh, Biden's would make, you know, at least a, at least sort of 10, 15 percent. You could probably s slice off uh, off some of the, the, the earnings rate of the, of the market in terms yep. of additional taxes and, and higher margins and, and things like that um, uh, with with the with the benefit that you've actually got better growth in the long term. Whereas yep. uh, Trump's a bit more um, extended pretend. So, yes, earnings will probably look good for 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 another year or two, and under under Trump, if he gets up, gets up, but um, you, you've got to keep worrying about that. Uh, that just that we're stuck in the same position where we are, where just that low growth um, grind under under Trump is, is more likely. Whereas I guess Biden, it's more likely to be a, a, a down at the start and then. Well, within within four years, I suppose you'd probably be getting some some recovery on that. Oh, um, I think I think much I quicker than that. I, oh, so I, I guess what I'm saying is, if you're going to give up, no, but if you're going to give up ten percent of your earnings, 10, 15 percent of your earnings in tax cuts, then um, you'd be lucky to get that back. As a company, you'd be lucky to get that back by the end of four years. Hmm. Would you say? Uh no, I reckon two. I mean, don't forget, you know, you you you'll get much better top line growth yes you'll get a margin squeeze but but you'll be selling more staff and it won't take long for firms to to start investing into those higher wages you know with with various you know automations mm. and so productivity will lift as well so i i think you you know you you would definitely see an initial hit no doubt um, mm. But I think within two years you start to see some pretty good um, turnaround, and certainly within four, I, I would yeah. expect yeah, the economy yeah, within, to, to be much four, better than it was. It would alternatively. Mm. Um, so. Oh yeah, well, the, the counterfactuals is different. <laughs> yes. What I'm saying is there's a there's a difference between saying will, yeah, if there's a difference between saying un, under the existing one, you, if you're just going to grind and it just keeps grinding lower. Then, then you you, have, you you absolutely do definitely much better as an investor from from um, the Biden side over over a longer term. But um, the reality is markets don't price off that that long earnings anyway. They they, do, they generally look at the next year, maybe the next two years in some cases. Yeah. But, um, oh no, I completely agree. There's an initial hit, no doubt. So shorter term is definitely more bearish for for stocks, uh, yeah. and I guess therefore probably more bullish for uh, credit, although not necessarily, if you think that uh, those wage rises will flow through to uh, increased wage inflation, but I, I'm not sure that you could draw that conclusion anyway.
Yeah. I mean, and, and then there's also this question about timing in terms of saying, well, um, you know, there's ideally for, I guess for him is you're getting, well, you don't want to be, you don't want to be knocking people over at the bottom of the cycle. You don't want to be making the, the, the crash worse in terms of the, the crash in, in, um, in earnings that, that we're seeing from companies. Um, and, and we're going to start, start seeing more bankruptcies is, um, you know, that's your other, your other issue is if, if, if it's all sort of full on day one, right, cop this, everyone gets these big tax cuts, uh, tax hikes, hikes yeah. plus, um, plus all these immediate hikes in, in earnings, um, uh, just just as 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 companies are deciding whether they can whether they'll make it or not through the cycle or whether they need to declare bankruptcy, you might actually end up making that 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 part of, even a bit lower that whole bankruptcy um, part. Whereas if if it's if it's more time to sort of be a bit more gradual or a bit more as as um, as the economy is starting to recover, um, you get to see it. Then I think there's you know, sure that's another factor that will factor into how the investment outlook takes. Well, that, that obviously depends as well on the election outcome, which we'll come back to because uh, we're talking really in terms of a Dems clean sweep here, um, or, or for that matter, you know, a, a, a status quo under Trump, mm. uh, and there are other possible outcomes. Okay. Yes. So, um, so next next page, uh, you know, with with that kind of a setup behind us, we want to look at possible kind of black swans that are that uh, are going to hit this, and some of them are already here. Uh, one of them is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, which is not a huge deal in and of itself, and, and uh, that is the uh, US Supreme Court judge, uh, progressive judge, uh, who died recently, and uh, so has complicated politics a great deal is the main implication because they, they need to elect a new Supreme Court justice. And uh, that's just a huge kind of distraction for Congress uh, as as the uh, second of our black swans here, which is uh, stalled fiscal support during, during the virus. Um, it's complicated those negotiations a great deal. We already had uh, stalled, um, stalled negotiations on the CARES program. Uh, with the Dems demanding much more than the Republicans wanted to give, which is a really odd position for the Republicans to get themselves into, given, you know, they're the ones who are in government are going to get blamed. Uh, but anyway, that's how the chips fell. And uh, so the Ginsburg negotiations or post-Ginsburg negotiations have complicated all of that a great deal. Uh, you know, the likelihood is that the Republicans will get another nomination up prior to the election uh, or or just prior and after, depending on how they think that it might influence the way the turnout and getting Republicans out to vote. Uh, and so they'll have a, what, a 6-3 kind of conservative majority in, in the Supreme Court uh, if there is any need for it to intervene in the election result. Uh, we don't necessarily see that as material though, because you have to assume that the justices are influenced by politics, and mostly they're they're kind of uh, pretty well screened before they get to this level. Anyway, there's not many kind of political nutters that can get through to this stage, and so that's not a, a hugely concerning kind of risk. Uh, but the big risk is that simply that the Ginsburg uh, replacement issue has really complicated negotiations over fiscal policy. So. It doesn't look like we're going to get a new fiscal package before the election, uh, and that certainly has amplified election volatility for the stock market uh, because you know you have already pretty clear evidence that that falling uh, fiscal support for households is starting to impact spending, uh, and you know there's no more coming now until we can clear the decks until um, January, at least probably. Uh, and so that's quite an economic blow. Uh, and then that that has, uh, you know, monetary implications and, and you might call this a black swan or some kind of, a, you know, unexpected outcome. If fiscal is stalled and the stock market is really struggling with the election uh, possibilities, both political and economic, then, you know, it sets up the possibility of, 
you know, with such an inflated stock market, does the stock market need to crash to prevent itself from crashing? By that, I mean it is thoroughly supported by very loose monetary policy and uh, and fiscal policy. And so does it need to remind uh, policymakers that without those supports, it will fall? And so it has to fall to stop itself from falling. Uh, and that, that brings you kind of full circle back to the Federal Reserve. And you have to ask, you know, what if markets really do start to get a bit unruly? And I think at this case, the base, the base case is still further falls. Um, you know, when does the Fed step in? Uh, what kind of influence might that have on the election result? Uh, difficult to know. Uh, you know, where is the Fed put? How far below? Uh, and what would it do? Uh, you know, it's it's. I don't think it's imminent. Um, Powell was in Congress last night, demanding more fiscal and trying to, you know, unblock the logjam. But that that isn't going to happen. It looks like. So, you know, the 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 buck's going to stop with him sooner rather than later, if markets keep falling. So, so there's another, you know, sort of double. Double black swan there in that stalled fiscal may lead to further monetary intervention if markets, you know, get unstable. Yeah. And and we've, David and I we've, we've spoken about the the irony is that you know markets will need to crash a bit in in order to get um, either politicians or the the, the Fed going so <clears> that <throat> that'll prevent markets from crashing further. Yes. Um, so. So yeah. Um, other other possible black swans well obviously you know trump is is really giving china an absolute thrashing at the moment uh and it's pretty out of the box some of the stuff he's doing if essentially um you know nationalizing chinese assets more or less for the u.s private sector and that's pretty intense stuff Mm. with um wechat tiktok etc uh there's no reason for him to stop that like uh, he might just continue on. Uh, it's pretty good politics for his base, and it makes it, you know, by definition, I think makes uh, the Biden camp look certainly less China hawkish. If if that, you know, in people's minds, concludes China weakness, you know, that that's probably Trump's goal. Uh, so, how intense does he get? Uh, and you know, how long does does China just cop it? At the moment, they've been very, very soft in response. Um, like when you consider <clears throat> the kind of res- the kind of response we got out of uh, the push for COVID nineteen transparency, uh, or during the trade war prior to that, China was much stronger in its responses uh, to than to what to Trump's recent stuff. Um, the obvious thing it could do is start to pull back from the trade deal, but they're not doing that. Uh, so, you know, what China doesn't want to have a conflict with Trump prior to the election, it seems. Why do they want a democratic uh, regime? Uh, I can't answer these questions. I don't know. But, but I mean, there's obviously a danger that either Trump goes <coughs> so far with, a, with his um, China bashing that he either upsets the markets or he just simply pushes Beijing too far and there's a backlash. Um, there is daily, you know, kind of um, saber rattling going on in the Taiwan Straits. Uh, all sorts of stuff happening there, which there's no need to go into. Um, I don't think we reach a point here where we get a tail wagging the dog uh, conflict with China, or a small scale war or something of that nature. Uh, seems unlikely. <laughs> quite unlikely but um perhaps by accident who knows um but certainly and it's probably worth saying as well china china would seem to have a preference for um for not trump uh, yes well uh, yes not, not so. to say not to say it'll necessarily be better for them but but um and, and you would think that they would recognize um that you know a that if, if they inflame U.S. nationalism, that's probably going to end up with more votes for China, for, for Trump than, than if they don't. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really debatable which would be better for China. I mean, Trump, Trump's certainly done a marvellous job in unmasking the Communist Party, mm. I think. 
uh, and changing, you know, and, and really destroying its uh, soft power push, you know, into uh, imperialism, economic imperialism. And that's been a huge long term blow, no doubt about it. But with that gone, you know, is China better served by, you know, a democratic regime that seeks to uh, multilateralize that conflict without walking away from it? Or by a Trump who maintains unilateralism and alienates allies. You know, if you accept as the base case that China decoupling or Cold War, or whatever you want to call it, is now inevitable, then arguably you're better off with Trump if you're mm-hmm. China. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, uh, who knows what calculus they've made, but there certainly is some kind of risk here of some some sort of China black swan. Uh, Antifa and BLM. Um, Again, I, who could say? I mean, there are ongoing rights, ongoing protests um, and conflict. Uh, the law and order issue, could it get inflamed? Could Trump, you know, invade one of his own cities in crackdowns? Who knows? It's just, again, it's one of those those civil strife issues that's clearly bubbling away in the background uh, that we need to be aware of. Very difficult to predict. Just raises the temperature of politics again. Uh, and so something we need to watch. Uh, and so swinging across to the election outcomes. Um, so Dave, just before we do that, we've had a question yep. pop in as well. Yes, um, sure. We might as well uh, tackle now. And um, and anybody else who's thinking of, uh, of popping in questions, of course, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash webinar in the, in the chat box there. Um, question here, do you think the average US voter is going to be thinking in such a long-term manner? Uh, people seem to be very angry about the now, but the later is largely ignored. Uh, yeah. Can't answer that. <laughs> oh, I think they're absolutely right. I, I guess what, yeah. we're, what, what we're talking about is we're talking about what we think the, the outcomes are from a from an investment sense from, from these taking a longer term view, whereas whereas you're absolutely right that I think the average, the average voter in, in any country will vote with um, you know, the swinging voter will vote with you know the, the latest thing that that excites them, and so um, you know uh, uh, something that the the rose nationalist in you know like going to going to war with China or a small scale war with China is going to rise nationalistic impulses in in US that are probably going to benefit Trump, but it's not a um, it's obviously not a good thing for for either country in the longer term. So mm. yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, I guess having the black swan section is really about that in the so, insofar as, you know, times are, are tempestuous, yes. So there's all sorts of short-term risks hmm. um, where that anger could be corralled uh, or misappropriated by an unscrupulous populist. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely possible that that, uh, that anger could cause a boil over. Very good. Okay, we'll jump across to outcomes. So, I mean, my base case is still that the Dems win and probably comfortably. And my, at the end of the day, this really comes down to the virus for me and what I said before, and that is I think when the rubber finally hits the road, the Americans are, are rational enough to do the right thing, having exhausted all other options. And... And so I just think killing 200,000 of your countrymen is a bridge too far. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what the polls say. And I think, I think they've probably been corrected enough uh, to predict the outcome at this stage, barring, you know, Trump really being able to, to swing some new scandal. Um, so that being said, um, I might just um, uh, swing down to the to the bottom one, uh, the number four, or rather uh, rather than number two. The Dems might win and might even get a clean sweep, but it might happen might not happen straight away. And I think that this is one of the outcomes that's really bugging markets. Uh, you know, we've seen Trump just today and pretty consistently hit trolling the election big time, <laughs> especially around postal votes. Uh, he's he's obviously setting up to dispute the outcome. Uh, It's entirely possible that he wins on the night and then loses the election weeks later owing to postal votes. 
which he is already, you know, firing bazookas at daily to ensure that they have no credibility, uh, in which case, you know, we'd be into all sorts of constitutional crisis uh, if we got that far. Um, you know, the other, the other option, of course, is um, uh, Dems within the White House, um, but not the Congress, and that might be the one of the better case outcomes. Not, uh, the, Senate. Not the Senate, you mean? Uh, sorry, the Senate. Um, uh, and, you know, markets tend to like policy paralysis, for the reason, you know, obviously the people can't stuff things up. <laughs> um, but that said, if the election's that close, it kind of it's rinse and repeat back to number four, you know, which is any, anything other than a really decisive democratic victory you know, might fall victim to uh, to Trump and his populism. I mean, today he was asked directly, will you ensure a peaceful transition of power? Uh, and he basically said, no, <laughs> he won't. Yeah. In fact, he said, if you don't, you don't have the ballots, you won't need the transition. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I mean, they're pretty extraordinary statements, even for a known troll. Yeah. You know, well, and, I mean, and it, also suggesting that people should test out by by voting in by voting in person and voting by by yeah. mail. Yeah, vote <laughs> so, for me twice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I mean, uh, there, there's some pretty scary outcomes. Uh, probably these are nervous giggles you can hear from me. Uh, I don't, you know, the idea that tr that the uh, U.S. constitutional in some in some way breaks owing to this uh, would be a terrible outcome for the world um so uh hopefully we don't get there but in terms of markets you know if you end up having to uh go through a, a, a lengthy period of uncertainty trying to figure out who's running the country then i believe by january 3 uh, a whole bunch of the senate lose their seats and then and that includes nancy pelosi uh and then Gen 20, Trump would be out of a job. Uh, and, you know, if it's still in the Supreme Court or still being tried, figured out, uh, it then reverts back to the Senate leader, but Pelosi will be gone. So. Uh, sorry, but, sorry Pelosi's, uh, the, Pelosi's the House, so. Oh, sorry. Is it? House leader, is she? House leader, uh, yeah. Right. Sorry, I'm getting these things confused. But. Uh, so she, she, the the speaker actually does inherit the presidency if there's a paralysis, but Nancy Pelosi won't be in power either, and so there's all sorts of new complications. Is is the point I'm making? So there's potential for real flux and chaos in Washington uh, around it, uh, and and obviously that's that's not good for markets. And the longer it goes, the more the more vicious it's going to become, and the more reliant the markets will become on the Federal Reserve. Uh, which brings us to markets, and this is no longer conjecture. We've got a chart in here showing um, uh, the, the VIX term structure, that's the volatility term structure, and, and it's clearly indicating that around around the election there's uh, a, a serious volatility risk. Uh, and we're already starting to see that priced into stocks. Um, we're seeing the Australian dollar get belted, which we, you know, you would expect to continue uh, the the 2020 the second half well the last sort of six months smash of the US dollar has suddenly uh, disappeared and what was a seriously unbalanced market that was betting against the US dollar has now uh, reversed upwards uh, spectacularly uh, and so and, and, and actually let's just talk about the irony of that as well David that, that this is the same yes. thing that happened in the um, financial crisis is yes know, that crisis centered on the US um, you know, most of the pain happening in the US, but the US dollar rallied significantly. That's right. I mean, uh, as we've discussed many, many times, the US dollar is still, you know, the number one kind of safe haven trade when you get uh, global instability, but ironically, especially US instability, uh, which of course is usually global anyway, by implication. And the US dollar is one of the reasons for that. Um, you know, as we get a, a liquid cycle, uh, business cycle, US dollars flow out of the US into emerging markets and other jurisdictions looking for higher return. And so the US dollar falls. But the moment we get trouble 
um, then it, they flow back to the center and the US dollar starts to rise and, and that virtuous cycle reverses and actually makes the US growth problem everybody's growth problem because they all run out of dollars, their interest rates start to rise, commodity prices fall, uh, and the re whole reflation trade reverses. And so that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, it's still in its early, in its infancy, uh, but we have, uh, what, we've got um, six weeks to the election, and then of course, some unknown period of uncertainty beyond the election. Uh, so there's plenty of time here for this to really get moving. Uh, and I'm seeing all sorts of early warning indicators in markets that are suggesting it, it may well continue uh, as well. You know, you have this fundamental driver to give, to put real meat on its bones. Uh, so, you know, that, that you, can, you can kind of follow the implications of that through for Australia, um, falling stocks, uh, falling Aussie, um, falling all, all fall, falling commodities. Uh, 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 and although China would find um, an iron ore, I think would probably be able to, to sh sort of throw this off going into the end of the year, it will, it will be also uh, these days, iron ore is sensitive to the US dollar more than it used to be. And so I would expect it to get pretty hard too. Uh, and, and so you'll have quite a shock coming out of this, um, this whole election kerfuffle. Um, uh, and so if that's big enough, uh, which it may well be, you know, 2021, if you can look through uh, these, this, this politics uh, that hopefully would resolve itself constitutionally rather than through various forms of strife, um, if it comes, of course, we might just get a clean result, uh, then you know, next year we have, we're a long way from defeating the virus, but we're certainly um, much better situated than we were coming into this year with various methods, means and policies uh, capping the virus these days uh, and allowing a slow grind higher in, in economic activity. And the next wave of that is vaccines and vaccine inflation. Uh, so uh, 2021 could shape as a, uh, a decent rebound uh, in global terms. Uh, and so this would pose a pretty decent buying opportunity if we see value appear in markets uh, owing to these various political shocks. Uh, that's my hope, in fact, for what happens, uh, given markets are just so grotesquely overvalued at the moment, it's difficult to, uh, to buy anything at all. Um, uh, so, I've got we've got a couple more charts there that are really just uh, showing you that the uh, volatility is really starting to get priced, uh, and uh, and yeah that that more or less um, wraps it up. Um, I might just flip over to you, Damo, to um, give a wrap on what we're doing and and the investment outlook. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think the um, you know, obviously David's spoken through a number of different scenarios here, and and we're headed into to what, what could be quite different depending upon uh, how the votes go. and But but it seems pretty clear we're, we're headed into a period of volatility before that. Um, I guess we're taking the view that, that, that your best case over the next little while is is um, sideways in, in, in markets. And, um, you know, the worst case is, is, is in stock markets and, and the worst case is considerably down. Um, we think bonds are going to have to um, you know, still give you some value in, in those scenarios. We saw during the week, um, you know, prominent economists came out in Australia suggesting that, um, you know, that, that uh, bonds still needed to go lower. We had the, the RBA talking about um, potentially maybe thinking about other things that it might need to do once it's decided that, uh, you know, the, the little that it's done so far is, isn't enough. Um, we had a former prime minister out last night, um, you know, haranguing the, the, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia. The reverse more. bank? <laughs> Reserve, reverse bank, as they called it, yes. So, um, you know, it's 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 the point that you know Phil Lowe um, has been there for a number of years now, and I don't think he's ever met his inflation target, has he, Dave? He did one quarter. One quarter, right? There you go. In, so, four, in four years. In four years. Yeah. So yeah. So you know, um, and and he, I think he does get paid a million dollars a year to do it. So that you know, that you think there'll be a few, a few calls for uh, for somebody who can who can um, try and do more. But having said that. Um, 
Oh, well, actually, I won't, I won't go too much into the whole RBA bit, but but I think that the, the issue for us is that we still think there's 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 a case for bonds, and that so we're not through this yet, um, and that you know the next little while is going to be the volatility is going to um, uh, mean that you know, holding either international stocks and or bonds is is going to give you a better outlook than than trying to hold all these stocks through it. We did um, shorten our duration though. Um, basically yeah. because of the, the sort of risk reward in in the in these short term issues versus uh the, the sort of the the coming vaccine wave which may cause steepening in the curve mm. yeah the question is um and then the big question on that side is, is whether you do start gov getting governments really spending some money and at that stage the, the long end you know um we'll, we'll, you'll start to see that in the long end so so yeah so we're, we're a little bit more cautious at, at the long end that's right um uh, in terms of the, um, yeah, it is still this this whole thought though. We're, we are in this very low re, um, return environment. We, we still have valuations at at extreme highs, um, and so um, you know, we we need to expect volatility. Once once you get ex expensive markets, um, you don't need very big movements in in some of the underlying fundamentals to actually see markets move quite considerably. So um, you know we're certainly expecting to be a lot more active than we have over the last few years. Um, over the next little while, and um, you know, it's about trying to trying to um, trying to thread that needle in terms of picking up the the, the switch between these. And, and as we see um, particular assets get hit, um, is is the, it back into cash, and then and then onto the uh, the next opportunity is sort of where we're looking. So, um, and and the other thing I'd sort of I want to highlight is that um, we basically had the, the 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 fastest fall ever, and then the fastest rise ever. Um, I do think there's a um, markets uh, are moving at a much faster pace than they have in the past, mm. and so for for retail investors who are going to take a long time potentially to get comfortable with with regime changes, um, they need to sort of keep that in in mind that um, they're probably going to need to um, to move a little bit faster than what they have in the past, and 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 be prepared to be a bit more tactical in terms of the um, in terms of the switches mm. uh, in order to just get any returns out of out of these markets. Because it, it'll be very easy to to, um, to sort of you know dump your money into cash and then and then sort of be sitting there a couple of years later going well your markets did sorry the economy did recover or the economy did reach a, a low point but um, your know, markets ran up way way ahead of it. Yeah, very good. Thanks, thanks, Amy. Quick question for me actually. Um, so uh, in our in our larger uh, tactical options that we've got, um, we've got the obviously the direct international access to well, between what ten and fifteen markets, I think, from memory. Um, are there countries and sectors, obviously, given the fact that you know every every country is sort of running its own race against COVID at the moment, um, that's sort of on the on the, the front of the shopping list, so to speak. Are, there, are, there, are we looking at it that way, or are we sort of just taking a more broad approach? Uh, from a from a tactical uh, piece. Look, I think um, most of the world seems to be in the same um, basket for for a lot for a lot of the coronavirus. I think there's certainly you know you can you can say that some some are worse than others, but um, uh, but but not not considerably so. Except except maybe somewhere like a China or um, if you look at um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, have been pretty successful in terms of um, uh, stepping Second out the virus. But, <laughs> but but the economies in those certainly aren't. None of those have improved particularly, yep. um, and none, you know, we're not looking. Um, yes, yeah, so, so so I guess for e economically speaking, we don't see a, a huge difference between um, between the different countries. Mm -hmm. What we do see though between sectors is definitely said some some big differences. Mm -hmm. And so where where we're seeing the most volatility is somewhere where we don't, we, we don't really don't want to play, which is in the in the recovery stocks in terms of um, you know say travel. Um, mm -hmm. That's where you see quite a lot of uh, volatility within that. So that that's one area where we're we're avoiding just because we we don't think that's um, we think it's far too early to call the end um, on on that. And so um, while while it's if you do get this massive this miraculous recovery, um, those stocks would be very very cheap. Um, but they're they're not cheap if you're expecting you know this to be um, extended. And that that's what we're thinking. Um, some of the other sectors though uh, is. It's 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 hard to try and find the ones where, again, it's it's, it's an interesting bit about the, the clear winners are, are, are very expensive at the moment. Um, so from from coronavirus, um, and and I guess companies that either benefited um, in their business model or, or the business model was unaffected, and so it, it's really playing around the edges of those where we're looking for for value. And and it we do find it tends to be um, uh, 
it, it does tend to be some some uh, European companies um, in, in some of the fringe markets, but generally speaking, a lot of the companies we're, we're picking up do tend to have um, some more broader exposure, I guess, globally than so. Th so they happen to be listed in in say a European market somewhere, but the um, the exposure you get is is pretty is a pretty broad. Um, world exposure. Mm. So, so that, that's one place we're looking. Um, and the other thing from a sector perspective, I guess, is is worth noting that, um, you know, a, a bit of a, um, a favorite in the uh, Australian market is is to be chasing the banks. Yep. And, um, you know, we saw the banks um, rally very hard off their lows, um, you know, a couple of months ago. So they sort of sort of hit, hit the lows with the coronavirus and there was all this concern about banks and, and um, the problems they're going to have from bad debts and, and all these home loaners who aren't paying their, their, their mortgages and just accruing the mortgages. Um, and then, a, then, a certain, then sort of around about June, um, that sort of alleviated and, and the banks went on this big run and they've almost given it all back now on, on that same view is that um, you know, in the longer term, if you're looking through um, a period where, pe where people generally have much higher debts, but, but effectively have the same income and unemployment's much higher, then, then the banks are, um, are going to lose out from that. And in an era of low interest rates where the, um, the, the central banks are all talking about lowering the, um, the longer term interest rates curves and flattening the, cur the bond yield curve, um, that's detrimental to banks as well. And so, um, yes, yeah, so that's certainly another area where we, um, we want to be avoiding. Mm, okay, very good. All right, fantastic. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Uh, terrific show. Plenty to uh, come, I think, on, on obviously uh, the election piece. And uh, as you say, I think volatility is going to be a, a huge component of, uh, of the markets going forward as well. And we're sort of seeing a little bit of that in the last, uh, last few weeks and most of September. So um, thanks again. Um, uh, th and also thanks for the, uh, for the question. A question for the audience, actually. If uh, you're listening in and you're, you're near our uh, YouTube chat is to drop in your answer to how do you think markets will respond to an election win in either direction. Um, so feel free to drop in some questions, uh, oh, sorry, some answers there in, in the comment box, and uh, we can uh, have a bit of read through and, and, and continue the discourse. So uh, on that note, we hope you've enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to see more of our content, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash content. To stay up to date with news from us, follow us on social media. We always appreciate guest or topic suggestions. So if you've got one, feel free to drop them in the comments of today's YouTube video. And finally, if you know anyone who gets something out of today's episode, feel free to share with a friend, let them know about it and help our podcast grow. So on that note, thanks very much for your attention today. Uh, terrific show and uh, we look forward to catching you at the next one. Cheers.